Hello, and welcome to Conversations from the World of Allergy, a podcast produced by the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. I'm your host, Dave Stukas. I'm a board-certified allergist and immunologist and serve as the social media medical editor for the Academy. Our podcast series will use different formats to interview thought leaders from the world of allergy and immunology. This podcast is not intended to provide any individual medical advice to our listeners. We do hope that our conversations provide evidence-based information. Any questions pertaining to one's own health should always be discussed with their personal physician. The Find an Allergist search engine on the Academy website is a useful tool to locate a listing of board-certified allergists in your area. Finally, use of this audio program is subject to the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology Terms of Use Agreement, which you can find at www.aaai.org. Today's edition of our Conversations from the World of Allergy podcast is from our Hot Topics series, designed to discuss current topics in a manner suitable for medical professionals, patients, and the general public. We are very pleased to welcome Dr. Matthew Greenhaut to the show. Dr. Greenhot is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and the Director of the Food Challenge and Research Unit at Children's Hospital of Colorado and the University of Colorado School of Medicine, located at the Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora, Colorado. Dr. Greenhot has, has led an extensive research career focused on food allergy, providing insight into shared decision-making, cost-effectiveness, disparities, and implementation of best clinical practice. He is a member of the Joint Task Force on Practice Parameters for Allergy and Immunology, and has authored or co-authored over 170 peer-reviewed publications, including his lead author on the recent rostrum that we'll be discussing today titled, Managing Food Allergy in Schools During the COVID-19 Pandemic, which is currently available online at the website for the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology in Practice. Now, before we get into our discussion, welcome Dr. Greenhaut to the show. It is extremely important for our listeners to understand that both Dr. Greenhaut and myself are co-authors on this paper, along with 14 other allergists. This rostrum, as well as today's conversation, are not guidelines, nor are they formal recommendations from the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. As you'll hear in our discussion, the goal of this paper in today's podcast is really to provide balanced viewpoints based upon evidence to assist families allergists in schools during these very unprecedented times. And with that, Dr. Greenhot, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Stukas. Yeah. Well, you know, before we get into some of the, the meat of the article, we're recording this in early August 2020, a time when we know that COVID-19 cases continue to increase throughout the country as well as the world, and also as schools across the United States are preparing for a possible return to the classroom in various you know, shapes and forms. This is a very dense topic in general with a lot to consider for each family. But before we get into specifics related to food allergies, what advice have you been offering to families centered around important points to consider, such as risk assessment and mitigation and things along those lines. So what, what kind of conversations are you having right now? Well, these are definitely some unusual conversations right now. Um, you know, I mean, the, the world basically has turned up on its head and it's been that way for a while. And it teases us with periods where we think things may go back to normal only to understand that it was just sort of a little bit of a lull. Reminds me of a kid growing up in South Florida with hurricanes, you know, when the eye of the storm would sort of pass through and you'd be told, don't run outside because there's more coming on the other side and people are like, oh, it looks fine. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, I don't even think we're, we're even at the eye of this, but, um, you know, I, I, I try to remind people that um, I'm really an allergist at this point. And even within allergy, I'm really just doing food allergy and that, you know, my, my, my take on things is really sort of uh, very siloed in terms of what I do and how I see the world and, and what I research. So, you know, um, yes, I'm still a pediatrician, but that part of me is sort of, um, I'm not the best person to ask for like, what should I do about my kids going to school? And, you know, cause I haven't even figured that out for my own. Um, of course that would assume that I have full autonomy of decision-making as an adult in my house, which I, I don't probably for <laughs> good reasons. Um, but, um, you know, it, it, it is hard and I'm struggling like every other parent. I have a 15 year old who's going into her sophomore year and she's a competitive swimmer and going to school and being with her friends and being able to have her swim season means the world to her. I have a sixth grader who is starting at a performing arts school out of district. So one kid, uh, we live just south of Denver. So one kid is in uh, the Cherry Creek school district. The other one's in the Denver school district. They do not have policies that are identical. My, my son will not go live until at least mid-October, whereas my daughter has been offered one of three options 
Um, and, and those have evolved even over the last week in terms of, you know, do you go live? Do you do a hybrid program or do you do it totally online? We've elected the online mainly for continuity because of the way that they cohort, that kids could be cohorted due to their athletic team or their social group and not their class. If their class is in quarantine for a specific test, you don't have access to any materials because your class is fine. You've been the one that's quarantined. So she could go weeks on end at potentially without having any access. So they, that wasn't going to work. So, um, you know, risk mitigation or whatnot. I mean, I think people should be wearing a mask. There's, there's little to no excuse in my opinion. I would say no excuse, but to be a little bit more global, there's very little or limited excuse. Um, washing your hands and staying, you know, two meters apart. Um, these general principles are as good as we have until we can figure out sort of what underlying immune defect can be uh, taken advantage of here to, to build a vaccine. Um, so there's that level of risk mitigation. Then there's always sort of the conversations that um, the food allergists have come around August or July or whatnot. Mm. What are we going to do about my kid in school? What are we going to do about sort of, you know, how are we going to keep them safe from, from their allergen or from other kids? So uh, there's a nice intersection of these things happening at this point in time. Um, and, uh, you know, to more uncertainty, all, all you have to do is add just even a larger amount of uncertainty with, with conflicting guidelines from the AAP, from the CDC, from your state and from your local government. And, um, it's a tough spot right now for people to be in because I, there, there is no clarity. We're used to clarity. As us as scientists, we're used to there being sort of a really a best strategy forward. And there isn't. And and sort of, and I know you and I started writing this article uh, was it back in the middle of May. Um, we had a mutual conversation about, boy, this is going to be a mess and we need some clarity because now you've got multiple issues sort of converging. Um, you know, you, you brought up an important point of, of this is a normally a, a an interesting time of year for families who have children with food allergies. They go back to school based upon grades and new buildings and new teachers and all the communication that we do and things like that. And, you know, when families ask you about, you know, ways to eliminate risk or when they start talking about they don't want to take any chances at all, how do you frame that conversation? You've done a lot of great writing in this and, and talks you've given and things like that. But how do you kind of help families just sort of um, – reassess that that sort of mindset of I need, I need to take away all risk uh, completely yeah I mean there there you can say something witty like well there's nothing risk-free in life and then you can sort of pull out a table of common things that they've done before they came to your office that were a greater risk than their child sort of reacting um, to whatever allergen at school People have a, a different level to be able to contextualize and understand what risk is. Um, you know, one of the things that I try to reinforce is that for most people, the most risky thing they'll do every day is get into a car and drive. Um, and there are good models about fatality rates and things like that. But even that's hard to understand and personalize because you're in control of that. You're driving, you assume I'm a good driver, I can beat the risk, just like any gambler at the table. You know the odds, but you have your system and you're going to beat it. So, um, you know, it, it is it is hard. What I try to do is sit down with parents and, and figure out, okay, what is it that you are afraid of? Are you afraid of them being around something? Are you afraid of them being exposed and eating it? Are you afraid of them having a reaction? Or are you afraid that that reaction is going to be really, really bad? And, I try to avoid certain words like fatality or whatnot because they're charged. They bring up a very visceral reaction, I think, in not only uh, among us as allergists, um, but to parents dealing with it. They, they don't care that their child might be one in a million to have that risk. They're focused on the one, whereas I think as scientists, we focus on the million. And, and actually, that's, that brings it back to what we're thinking about here with, with COVID and everything like that and, and all the data that are coming out suggesting that kids are really, I'm not going to, I'm not going to use a word thrown around like virtually immune or whatever that means. Um, but you know, there's a common perception that, you know, if your risk is low enough, then you don't have to worry about it. But to the person who's worrying about it, you're not going to be able, you see the numerator, you don't see the denominator. So that, that, that's hard. So when it comes to risk for food allergy in school, I try to reassure parents that this is actually some of the oldest data that we have that we're still using. If you look at where these, these studies have come from, 
Um, these predated me doing a fellowship and me doing a fellowship. I think I was still a resident when, when these studies happened where it was shown that, you know, you can smear stuff on your skin and it's not going to cause a systemic reaction. And actually, um, it, it, it was the, the Sinai study where, where they, they smeared um, different types of butter on the skin and showed that even non-allergic kids still got some erythema. So I think a lot of parents are concerned about the contact reactions and that gets, you know, you hear reaction. And one thing I try to tame, try, train my fellows to, to do is you can't use the word reaction. You need to describe what's happening because reaction to me is going to be interpreted very different to you and to a parent. So that little bit of rash on the skin probably isn't what we would consider a reaction and you can wash it off. But that was an important study to show that. And when you, you, you sniff, you know, an allergen at, at 12 inches from your face, that that's also not going to cause a systemic reaction. And that's not even going to um, cause a single drop in, in, in a PFT parameter. Um, and then you go to, and I, I, I tease my, my, my boss and my, my colleague, David Fleischer, because he was involved as a co-investigator in this study, but you know, where, where they, they, they smeared things at Hopkins, they smeared stuff on, on tables and showed the various ways that you could abate this. And then um, they dumped all the peanuts on the floor and, and stomped on them trying to, you know, provoke a, a dust cloud. Um, and they were unable to do that. And, and, you know, this isn't the most widespread replication, but these have been replicated a couple of times. It's, you know, and it's not new stuff. This isn't like something that came out last week and is in press and, and you know, you got to go hunt for it because it hasn't hit the mainstream yet. These are, it's 2020, right? It feels... <laughs> so far beyond that you know we're looking at data that are, are are 16 and 17 years old at this point that almost everybody in fellowship should have read about and if you haven't i implore you to go in and read about it now but these data show that there is really not the risk of an environmental exposure that some people may presume so as a scientist and as a as, as a physician and just as somebody who cares about the the health of their child try to explain this but often it, that's that doesn't reach them. They they hear it, but they're they're listening, but they're not hearing it, or they're hearing it, but they're not listening. Whichever, you know, there's there's not a deep processing of it, and they're just thinking, my kid is at risk going to school. The facts are very much on the side of the evidence here that most kids go to school and are fine. Yes, there are some kids who have had issues at school, but by and large, it's it's not an issue. And you could say, well, that's because we've done all these things and. That's hard to say. Studies have shown that most of the accommodations beyond hand washing and surface washing and simple things like not sharing food really haven't supported that they are reducing risk. Um, it becomes very charged. And I think we are inclined to come up with solutions that sound clever, but are not evidence-based. And then when these get put into policy, you, you tend to maybe forget that you're, you're, you're dealing with the one kid and there are 24 other kids that also have to go to school. And I think in a non-pandemic setting, yeah, you, you can do that. That, 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 that has worked. It's not the preferred strategy, but you know, schools ban foods and for them it's working. I mean, the scientific evidence would suggest that it, it's not having any effect and there might be some other things to consider there, but outside of a pandemic, you can do that. Now you're in a pandemic. Um, and everybody is going to have to eat in school. And I know this is a later question, but I'm, I'm sort of, I'll script you today. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but I mean, I know, I know that this is, this is where we want to get, and this is why we wrote the paper. How do you deal with accommodations in a classroom when everybody has to eat in the classroom and you're dealing with other external things? This is, you know, uh, like everything this, this spring and making a decision. Do I keep my practice open? Do I do this or whatnot? It is a slew of no win situations where you've got to try to choose the lesser of two evils and knowing that both are probably not decisions you would make in, in ideal situations. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's a great prelude to some of the specifics that we're going to talk about, but I just want to, I want to go back and summarize some of the important points you mentioned. So, I'm I'm hearing you say, and I agree wholeheartedly that you know this is an individualized approach. So for families that have concerns, um, you know you can get information from all kinds of sources, but it's not one size fits all. And we know so much more about food allergy management now compared to 10 years ago that you really need to have an individualized conversation with your own your child's own allergist uh, to address these concerns and talk about these things. Um, and then, like you said, it you know we, nobody wants this situation. We're all forced to to deal with the you know the best possibilities that we can, given the hand that we. We've been dealt. Um, so along those lines, 
before we get into specifics with food allergy, can you summarize just some of the, the key important points about what both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Centers for Disease Control advised in regards to return to in-person learning? You mentioned before about, you know, masks and uh, physical distancing and, and hand washing. Any other, any other big points there? Um, I, I think the, the, the AAP and the CDC, their approach is that the kids need to go to school. And that sort of the home learning is probably failing people for a number of reasons. Um, and th they're focused more on sort of the child holistically. Um, I, I worry about the data that are being used to formulate some of these conclusions. And, and actually there's a colleague of mine in infectious disease at, at, at my hospital who helped write some of these guidelines. Um, you know, they're, they're looking and saying the kids really, it's, it's, it, they may get it, but it's not going to transmit at the same rates. And there have been a million things that have been put out about sort of how the risk kind of magically stops at age 10 or whatnot. I'm an epidemiologist and a health services researcher. And, you know, I'm looking at studies that are being taken out of context from one country with a really strong public health infrastructure and just completely different cultural values about how healthcare and personal responsibility are taken um, and a different educational system. And we're trying to bring that here and saying, well, it worked there, so we should be okay. I'm a very much a prove it guy. And, you know, theory can break down in a lot of ways. And I've, I've written a lot of papers on sort of things about risk and odds and how, you know, even a 5% chance is really big when you put it on a population level. So I, I do worry that we may be using data that don't have full generalizability to the US, but I'm not a member of that committee on the AAP. I'm not CDC. I'm just a parent reading this and saying, boy, I hope this ages well, um, which, which worries me. But I think, you know, they are, I think at the bare minimum of sort of, you know, wear a mask, stay distance, but there's not a lot of nuanced guidance. I think they're allowing the schools to to do this on their own, which is probably the best way to do it because, you know, a rural school in, you know, uh, I'm thinking of my, my, my friend who practices up in Alaska, you know, a rural school up there and some of the reaches where, where she may cover for some of her patients, you know, might only have 10 kids in it, or maybe it's a one room schoolhouse or something. I, I don't know. I mean, somewhere around the country, you've got very, very small and very, very large. Like my daughter's high school is larger than the university I went to. So, I mean, um, class sizes and context and where you are and sort of the attitudes of the people in that area really are going to make or break this. And already you're seeing, um, well, we saw at least on, on uh, one picture of a high school with a pretty crowded hall. And I, I don't know the context if that was just everybody happened to be let out at that time, but mm -hmm. didn't look to be a lot of masks and didn't look to be a lot of spacing. So you know, if we're saying, you know, we really want you to do this and then nobody does it, well, we shouldn't be surprised at what outcome happens. And, you know, I guess you can make the argument then, are they really going to get sick or not? And that, that's what bothers me is that we're a little bit too deductive in assuming that, well, they're probably not going to get sick, um, which may sound hypocritical because we're about to talk, well, they're probably not going to have a peanut reaction mm -hmm. at school either. Um, you know, it, it Again, it, it's hard and it, it all, it's, it's who you are and how you interpret it. And I think sort of the, the counterplay here is how I think about this as a parent for my kids is exactly how the parent of a peanut allergic or a milk allergic child might think about the same advice that I give them and how large scale population health sometimes has problems translating down to the individual level because you see your kid and nothing else. And that's, that's good. I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways. Yeah. And, you know, that's a, that's a, a good point to kind of reinforce, um, as you mentioned, both with, you know, what's going on with COVID-19 and then as, you know, we've, we've been authors on, gui on various guidelines. It's a really hard thing to do. Um, and you have national advice and guidelines on how to go back to school. Then you have your state policies and guidelines and you have your county level guidelines. But none of that may apply to somebody who's in a completely different situation or contextual framework with their school size or their classroom size or, or their own personal health issues. So, um, you know, there are no guideline police out there that say, you know, you have to, you're going to get handcuffed if you don't follow it. Um, just as we're about to talk about now, these are simply, you know, things to consider, recommendations, and then each individual person really needs to take the information and say, how does this apply to me and how can I make decisions based upon that? Um, so along those lines, you mentioned, you know, one of the reasons that 
um, it was important to write this paper was the nuances surrounding you know food allergy management in the schools. Uh, but before we get into that, because we are going to have listeners from a wide variety of backgrounds, including those who have no idea what food allergies are, can you just give us some basic background for our listeners regarding food allergies, such as you know prevalence, how many children have food allergies, what are the most common allergens among children, and and what types of reactions can occur? Sure. Um, I mean, a food allergy is a specific type of an adverse reaction to a food. It's defined by a very specific immune mediated reaction. Um, the classical type that I think we are talking about mostly is IgE mediated, where there's a preformed antibody against the protein. That protein enters the circulation and it finds that, that, that antibody that's bound to a specific type of cell. It spits open all kinds of crazy granules within inside this cell that that makes you wheeze, sneeze, itch, cough, vomit, and in the worst cases, pass out, go into shock. And, you know, obviously that can lead to bad things. So for the, for those who aren't understanding what food allergy is, that that's sort of the biochemical sort of uh, reaction that can happen. Um, the prevalence of food allergies, it depends um, what data source you're looking at. I think commonly most people are are, are saying around uh, as as low as 4%, as high as 9%. Again, it depends. There was a recent self-reported survey that was published in the journal uh, from, from the AP called Pediatrics that suggested about a 9% prevalence. Um, most common food allergens, uh, milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanut, tree nut, um, fish, and, and shellfish. Um, although, you know, we say common eight, it, it's probably four of those that are maybe five that are causing most of the problem. I mean, there's a common 20 if you wanted to march it out. I mean, but um, classically, this is what we, we you know, uh, we have thought about in those eight. But I think, you know, it, 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 it's peanuts, tree nut, um, milk, egg. And, and, and in, in some circles, there's a growing concern about sesame um, and, and seeds. But again, there are, there are people who are allergic to everything. Um, for the purposes of school, this almost exclusively focuses on peanut and tree nut, although it really shouldn't because milk is um, arguably as prevalent and in some studies more prevalent. I guess it depends on the methodology there. Um, but, you know, these are common foods that kids eat to grow and develop. Um, and a small percentage of the population has some issue that they can't tolerate it and they have these, you know, potentially severe allergic reactions. Um, you know, school is synonymous with eating. Um, if, if you mm -hmm. think about um, every kid ate lunch at school that I, I, I mean, or you're supposed to eat lunch. I mean, you have a lunch break, whether you eat in school, mm -hmm. you go off campus or whatnot. But I mean, there's snacks. We used to have, um, you know, people would sell donuts before school and there was a, a store where you can go get an ice cream or a soda. And so, I mean, there's food at school. Um, you know, I grew up in, in, of the generation that probably 85% of us ate peanut butter and jelly, at least thrice weekly or something like that. Um, but that's not the environment that my children have grown up in where, you know, early on my, my, my daughter's school was, was entirely nut free. Um, and couldn't, she couldn't bring peanut butter to school because of the potential risk that this was going to cause a reaction in somebody else. So, um, you know, you've got kids that have to eat at school. You've got programs from the USDA that sponsor, um, you know, reduced cost or no cost meals, which for some kids, that's the only source of sort of steady food that they may get. Um, that might be the only consistent source of a, a, of a staple food such as milk that they get every day. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's unavoidable and you're trying to figure out how do I protect those who are potentially vulnerable and could have, you know, bad outcomes from encountering this allergen. Um, versus the other kids who have to eat it. And it becomes sort of, uh, you know, in, in, in game theory terms, this is a zero sum game where, um, you know, nobody wins. Um, and, and, in, and then the approach becomes what they call distributive, where, you know, you're trying to win at all costs so that the other side loses, so that your point of view is validated. And this is what we have um, played out all over the place that, you know, the logical approach would be, let's find a way for everybody to be happy and validated and, and, you know, but in these scenarios, it, it becomes almost exclusively played to protect the vulnerable child, which again, as a physician, I'm not going to argue with, but this is, 
you know, other parents have, have, have argued to me that, boy, this is really unfair because all my kid eats is peanut butter. So how are they supposed to have a lunch at school? They're going to suffer nutritionally. And that becomes a very difficult conversation. And then your next patient is, I can't believe this mother wants their kid to have peanut butter at school. Mm-hmm. To kill. I mean, it, it's, it's, I mean, you go back and forth and again, it's, it's, these are uncomfortable. There are, these are no win situations, you know, where you wish that there could be a way where everybody felt safe and secure and got what they wanted out of it. But that, that is not life. And that's what makes this such a, uh, you know, sort of a policy landmine of sorts. Yeah. And, you know, outside of COVID-19 and outside of just being in school, um, we know that, uh, you know, there are some, some basic strategies that families can adopt and some skills that they can learn uh, when they have children with food allergies that can help prevent reactions. Uh, and, you know, there's a path forward where you can successfully avoid these things and, and not have a significantly decreased quality of life. And we also know that, uh, that families that aren't given that education and don't have the opportunity to build those skills with the help of a, a knowledgeable professional, um, they suffer for it because, you know, they're, they're on their left you know, they're left on their own to imagine the worst. So what are some of those basic strategies that we, we work with families to, to help them learn? Sure. And, and this goes back to those, those studies, the ones that I'm saying that are, you know, um, 16, 17, 18 years old at, at, at this point. Um, this has shown that if peanut gets on your hands, um, that you can use soap and water and that will abate the residue. Um, this is also the same study that showed don't use hand sanitizer. That's just alcohol that may kill bacteria and some viruses, but it's not going to wash. Um, it's not going to wash allergen off your hands. So, um, I think the point of contact when you think about small children where their hands are everywhere, hands go into the allergen, they're not supposed to touch hands, then go into the mouth You have ingestion. And that's the most likely way that somebody will react at school. So strict hand washing policy after handling food. I mean, I do think that you can, you can do other steps to help that, to help set that up. Like maybe you shouldn't be doing the pine cone, peanut butter bird feeder so that, you know, don't craft with something so that you don't have to worry about extra hand washing. But if you're talking about just with lunch or stuff like that, strict hand washing, using a detergent cleaner to wipe down the surfaces. This can abate. There actually have been two studies that have shown that. Um, one with just sort of a, a, a little bit of an older generation technology and one with a very new sensitive polyclonal detection of all the different sort of uh, proteins within peanuts showing that this can be abated from um, virtually every surface and any residual point is, is at a very, very minimal quantity um, that's at really at the limit of what the probe can measure and it's not implying any clinical significance of that being there. So the strict hand washing and surface washing really are the two basic tenets of evidence-based practice of keeping your kids safe at school. Other things that can help with that, don't share food. Um, I think that's that's an obvious one because you know it's hard to control what, what, what these kids may be doing, um, but having this policy and starting it early to not share really uh, can, can help avoid these situations. Now, I'm not gonna say that that's easy to manage, but um, that, that's what most schools do. So you've got some, maximization of those things so that the no sharing the 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 surface washing and the and the hand washing um and when i advise schools and i write letters on behalf of parents really those are the three things that i um i emphasize i think it's good now that most states have a self-carry or even a a stock law of some type so that there's epinephrine nearby Mm -hmm. in case there is an ingestion and there are symptoms that will benefit from being treated um, so, I, I mean, I, I think that those are probably the only accommodations that are needed that have evidence that show that the risk can actually be decreased. Now, mm-hmm. where it goes a little bit um, into some variability are what they call food bans. So layering in, you know, should kids be prevented from bringing snacks that contain a certain allergen to their class? Should that be at the school level, should that be at the class level? Should it be individualized only in classes where there is somebody with an allergen? Now, from the, I'm gonna put myself in the shoes of a food allergic parent, I can totally understand how that makes sense because you're like, well, if it's not there, then it can't cause a problem. And how is that not the safest thing? Uh, And ironically, you know, while I, I would never argue that that doesn't make sense in theory in execution, that is very, very hard to sort of referee. 
um, and enforce. And um, there are studies that have shown that it's, it's not preventing the outcomes that one may think. It may actually be setting up a false sense of security. You've got the implementation issues and it's a contentious policy for the parents of the child who might ha have no or limited means or limited repertoire in that child's diet to have to send them to school wanting that allergen so that they can eat something that day. I mean, there are, there are kids out there that really subside on peanut butter and jelly and they're very picky and that might be all that they eat. And when you take that away, you can make claims that that reduces their health equity. Again, I don't want to get into the tug of war saying, well, my child's needs are more than yours. Like, again, nobody wins in that situation, but these policies lend to decisions like that being made or the other way. Well, you don't care about my child who could have, and I hate this term, um, life-threatening allergy. I mean, um, and the schools just want to educate the kids. They, they, they really don't want their, their mission isn't necessarily to serve and to cater food services and whatnot, and certainly not be um, medical providers in, in that sense as well. But this is the world that we are in now. And you've got, you know, a, as many as one in 10 kids in the classroom, potentially that could have a, a, a food allergy. If that prevalence estimate is, 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 is accurate at all ages, um, it is something that we have to deal with. So I, I think we're feeling out ways. I want to say that we had come to an equilibrium with policies. Um, you know, the kids can get accommodations if, if they need it. There's, there's mechanisms through the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act where um, individual education plans and Section 504 plans can sort of, where the parent can work with the school to set these accommodations up. And that's negotiated between the parent and the school. And it's individualized for the class or that context. And that, that's been the way that this has been done. That's a very good sort of um, segue into, you know, the, the specifics about in the school. And what I'll, I'll direct our listeners to, for those who aren't aware, and I'm sure many of them are, the Centers for Disease Control published voluntary guidelines uh, for management of school or for management of food allergy in the school setting um, and child care setting. I think about 2016, and those are available for free online for anybody to look at. That is a very comprehensive document that really covers a lot of nuanced situations that we won't be able to discuss today. There's just too many nuances to consider. Uh, but I just would like to add to your your great you know, intro there that, you know, for every family out there, there, again, just to go back to there's guidelines, there's risk and there's, there's situations, but that's going to vary based upon the age of your child, their known food allergen slash allergens, uh, the size of the classroom, the experience of the teacher with children who have food allergy, um, so on and so forth. So there's a lot of little individual factors to consider, and you're not going to find one document such as the paper that, you know, we're discussing today or any guideline that's going to address everything. So again, it goes back to just, you know, individualized conversation. And I think that's a good point. You know, those guidelines were voluntary. They were voluntary mm -hmm. for a reason, because I think um, the CDC at the time grasped that there probably couldn't be a one size fits all policy that would make sense for every school in every context um, that it was hard to enforce. But if you if you look around the guidelines that various states have, there aren't any that says banning foods in school in any context in the classroom or whatnot is what we recommend. Um, that that is uniform. So you know there are plenty of places out there that do it, and you know for better or for worse, it it, it is how they choose to manage it. Um, I, I just always worry that that may cause people to it's just like you tell people wear a mask in public well no i don't have to you this is my freedom i have my whatever whatever right you want to you know again i, I find it hard to believe that the people dumping tea in the, in the harbor in, in in 1772 sort of thought like wow what's next after tea we don't want to tax oh yeah don't wear a mask so you can't infect half of the people around you i'm sure that that was like next on their protest list and sort of, I think they would all rise from the grave and be the senseless for the way that we are behaving right now. But, um, you know, that that's a, a whole other conversation for our, our, our follow up podcast, which I'm sure you're going to invite me on. Uh, we'll just, we're just, we'll just put your email address and, yeah. uh, you know, cell phone number at the end of the interview yeah, for everybody. But I mean, it's, 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 you know, when you put a policy in that people don't like their natural instinct is to try to subvert it. So, 
that might, you know, there have been, and I don't have evidence that this is happening, but somewhere it's easy to believe that somebody may be trying to sneak that same allergen that they're supposed to ban just to say, see, this didn't do anything to your kid. And again, this is not what we want. We're trying to protect the children and set a good example of them in sort of, you know, sort of small level conflict mediation. But um, yeah, I, I mean, that that's why you just have to be careful. I think few people are going to argue like, oh, I really don't want my kid to wash their hands. That would just not work mm. for me I, um, yeah. and wash the desk surface. I mean, I you know, but the, the other ways that people have um, put into place to um, try to reduce risk, I think there are problems with those. I'm sure that I'm going to get some hate mail from certain segments of the community who disagree vehemently with this and, and say, this is the only way to protect. And again, everybody's entitled to their own opinion. I don't have all the answers. What I'm showing is what the evidence has shown and what the evidence hasn't shown. And, you know, these are hard things to study. We do have guidelines coming out. I've been part of a, of a large international panel um, run through the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Um, and McMaster's that has looked at this in what we call a, a grade fashion. So similar to the practice parameters that we're, we're, we're putting out, you know, this is a whole scale evidence synthesis method that really looks at the quality um, and the strength of the recommendations. And in that document, there, there, it's very clear, do not ban foods in school. This isn't going to work. So um, we're moving towards better evidence and towards sort of at least more unified consensus. But again, it's got to, there's got to be some flexibility there, but it goes, you know, that word voluntary on the CDC guidelines was quite intentional. Yeah. And it's flexibility is the key. I mean, oh my gosh, how many times have we said that just with everything we're doing these days with COVID-19 flexibility? I want, I want to go back to something you mentioned, ask you a, an interesting question, uh, which um, puts you on the spot a little bit, but you mentioned the hand washing and the cleaning and some of the basics that are going to be put in place inside the school setting during COVID-19. As hard as it may be to comprehend, given all the changes that are occurring in our world, are there actually advantages to these changes when it comes to food allergy management inside schools? Is there a bright side to some of this, perhaps? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if you're washing your hands, you're, you're washing any other bacteria off of there. I mean, who, who hasn't had, if you have kids, I mean, whose kid didn't go to school and sort of get when everybody else had gastroenteritis or a cold or mm -hmm. something like that? Whose kid didn't come home sniffling or other things that can happen with these, you know, um, I mean, it's it, so hand washing is good. You've got young kids who their hands are all over the place. If they have any illness, that's a good way of spreading. So when you're washing your hands, that that's a good thing. I think, you know, if you look at the hand washing, the not sharing food, the um, wiping of surfaces, that, that all plays into this distancing narrative to try to put some space between two people where there could be droplet or respiratory spread or droplet and respiratory spread uh, of, of, a, of a highly infectious disease. So um, these, these things are good. And I was, I was speaking with, with one of our, our, our co-authors on, on, on the, the paper who is not from the US and he's like, this is what they should be doing for food allergy anyways, just space them out. This could work yeah. and this could reduce some of the things. And, you know, that person's purview is, is very pragmatic and, you know, in a different, in a different sort of economy and in a different country about how they might choose to manage it. But I, I do think a lot of what's being done for COVID related um, management absolutely will benefit um, somebody at school with food allergy in terms of reducing their risk. Um, you know, yeah. Yeah, it, it, I think that's an interesting sort of sidebar to, to think about of with all the anxiety that we all have as parents. And, you know, I feel it as well. Of, you know, we know we don't know the best thing to do. There is no playbook for this. We have no evidence about what's going to happen when kids go to school during this pandemic because all the schools shut down in the spring. Um, but, you know, going back, because you are so evidence driven and, and knowledgeable when it comes to the, the research out there. What do we know about food allergy reactions at school? Are they actually occurring inside the school setting, including anaphylaxis? What part of the school are they happening in? Is it classroom? Is it cafeteria? Uh, you know, playground? Do we ha do we have any information on that? Yeah, there, there are there are some studies. I mean, the one that I, I always see quoted and it's actually misquoted is is the Massachusetts study from 2000. I think they did observation move. 2006 to 2008, I might, I might have the exact years wrong, but it said that, oh, 25% of, 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 of people who didn't know that they had an allergen will have anaphylaxis at school. And that included teachers in it. It mm -hmm. wasn't just the kids. So it's a, a little bit blown out. But yes, I mean, these reactions can happen anywhere that there is food. Um, and they do happen. 
Um, but again, you know, if, if you look at uh, the, the data from like the Chicago school study from 2014, I think they had something like 39 uses of, of epinephrine across the entire school district in a year. So it happens just like, you know, do kids get sick at school? Do kids have, uh, you know, sort of orthopedic trauma at school? Yes. I mean, they're, they're kids and these things happen. And then, um, you know, I don't think that there is a disproportionate rate of reactions happening at school, um, but they do happen at school. And that, that's why we send our kids with action plans um, so that we can, you know, hope for good management by people who might not be that familiar with how to manage a reaction. This is why we have, as a society, decided that it's a good idea to stock epinephrine um, because of studies like the Massachusetts study that show that there, there could be kids there who don't have, um, a, a, you know, a, a device. And, you know, in the worst case scenario, there have been um, a few fatalities noted at, at on school grounds. Um, you know, it, it, Again, it's it, it's it's limited, but you know it. These events do happen. Um, but again, if you're the, it goes down to the, how you conceptualize the risk, though. Um, you know, the one in a million. You know, it, it, if your kid is vulnerable, you're looking a little bit more closely at the one than at the million, and that is, you know, it it, it is hard to sort of get away from that because. All you can see is how your child could have a similar outcome, that they have a bad reaction, that they have to go to the hospital, that somebody could not help them. And that, that is totally fair and valid. And, and I understand that. And I, I, I deeply empathize with it. Um, I just think that the risk is probably a lot lower than people acknowledge. And um, we have to be careful not to amplify a message like you could could be at risk, sort of a fear-based messaging, which has become rampant. Um, you know, uh, just even the use of the word life-threatening. When I was a fellow, it was just food allergy. Somewhere between the time where I graduated fellowship and started to specialize in this, that modifier of life-threatening comes out. And again, does that help? Uh, you know, the arguments have been made that helps with awareness to so how, see how serious it is. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm sure that it's also driving quality of life in a direction that we don't want to, because you tag that connotation with the food allergy when that's probably highly unlikely to happen. And when it does happen, it's usually because you ate something that you weren't supposed to, and you didn't have your treatment there and you were delayed. Like it's, it's not just sort of, you know, it's not the immediate sort of, um, result that there are reasons why these things happen. But again, this is an uncomfortable discussion to have. I guess I've got a niche and sort of just going right for that third rail that's mm -hmm. electrified and reaching for it and sort of relishing and having these discussions and taking on the criticism and whatnot. But so, yeah. yeah. yeah but, but you raise, you know, I, I, to, what I'm hearing you say, and, and this is something I, I believe as well of, you know, for these very, very, very tragic and unfortunate events to occur. Oftentimes, there's a lot of nuance, as we've said several times before, but it's kind of like the Swiss cheese model, right? Um, oftentimes, there are multiple different things that line up in this very specific way that lead to these um, tragic and rare outcomes. But if you're able to apply some of the basics of management every step along the way, it can remove some of those holes or make that risk a lot less. So um, when we talk about, you know, just all the preparation that we can do, hopefully that can, you know, we can never eliminate risk, but we can significantly reduce it in such a way that we, you know, um, hopefully that's not a common occurrence, as you mentioned. Now, um, you, you talked before about sanitizer does not remove the food allergen from surfaces according to those studies so as we go back to school and, and some of the schools you know what if, and if they're using sanitizer in, in place of hand washing what are some things you know what what conversation points should parents have with the school uh in regards to that area yeah um my one piece of advice would be to tell them to stop get soap and water um mm. i know like but even if you think about I mean, do you remember as a med student when we could we could actually wash our hands and then all of a sudden you see the the, the bottles of sanitizer appear and <sighs> hospital epidemiology is like we want you to use this and we're like it's not as good they're like we know but you'll actually use it and i don't even want to get into the thoughts about doctors not washing their hands and stuff like <sighs> that but like i mean we become sort of uh i don't mean to brand this but we become a purell nation of some sorts I mean, it's just people just use that and it's, it's good. They're using it. So there's reduced bacterial spread, but for allergen transmission, that's not going to work. So 
I guess it's okay to use hand sanitizer in a class where there isn't a food allergic student, but if there is a food allergic student in there, it's gotta be soap and water. And they, they just have to bite the bullet on that one and do it. Um, even the sort of the, the wipes and stuff with the detergent, I, I, I soap and water that that's, we know that works. Um, yeah. And, you know, we know a lot of our the families that have children with food allergy, often they're dealing with, you know, atopic dermatitis and real sensitive skin and dry skin. And as the weather gets colder and things like that. So it, it's going to be important to talk about some of the, you know, unscented. Lotion. Yeah, hand lotion, unscented forms of soap, and and good you know good hand washing. Now, um, w without getting into a political conversation regarding masks, because I feel that we all know how you feel about that. Uh, is there anything specific to food allergies that people need to worry about about wearing a mask? That's a question I've received from some families. Um, I, I mean, the, the masks should be washed. I guess if somebody's like eating an allergen and they put their mask on, like, I mean, just because you'll, you'll touch your face, you know, um, that, yeah, if you're a non food allergic student, you should probably wash the, you should be washing the mask anyways, periodically. Um, you know, the masks actually could work here too. If you are really worried that your child is exquisitely sensitive and maybe one of the very, very, very rare cases where there is theorized airborne transmission or something or the smell or whatnot, that you're, you're putting a layer that could theoretically filter it out. Um, but it, it, you know, it, it does, it puts a barrier there. So I, I, I see, I guess there could be some benefit. There's probably no net benefit from that. Um, you know, it's not that I'm, I'm pro mask, I'm pro mask, but I, I, to me, it's just, it makes common sense. Like this is not that hard of an ask of people. Like yeah. I have my mask, um, and this is in the shape of my favorite college football team's helmet and, um, you know, have fun with it. The kids can express, they could do superhero masks or whatnot. Like this, this could be branded in a different way. Anyway. Um, no, but and you, and you raise an important point. It, you know, as we're two pediatricians here discussing, it's it's something that kids have to get used to, um, and, and it's it's important to get them involved in choosing their mask. And there's cloth masks. There's the the gaiters that my ten year old son loves. It's you know wear it on the neck and pull it over your nose and your mouth. And just to remind everybody, the idea behind everybody wearing masks is to reduce transmission because there's a significant portion of people that have COVID nineteen and they don't even know it. And so when they're asymptomatic or pre symptomatic, they can easily spread that through sneezing, coughing, large respiratory droplets, even from talking and singing they've, been, they've shown. So the mask is about protecting others, but that's not going to keep you from getting sick. So you have to wash your hands, physical distancing, all that fun stuff. Um, now let's go back to epinephrine. Um, you know, you mentioned this a couple of times, um, and this is, you know, there's a lot to discuss here. And we know that it's the first line treatment for anaphylaxis and, and children with food allergies are prescribed this to have available in case of accidental ingestion causing anaphylaxis or severe reaction. But what thoughts do you have on where it should be stored during the school day and who should yeah. be trained regarding the use? This is a good segue. I, I, this is where I, I really wanted to go. So in reading the rostrum, the, you know, the first recommendation is you know, hand washing. The second one, we talked about the bands. The third one is be evidence-based and reasonable. The fourth and the fifth recommendations really sort of evolve, I think, the paradigm of stock epinephrine. We make a case that, um, and, and part, of, part of the issue about this, just to give a, a, a quick minute of background, is that the CDC recommended everybody eats in the classroom. And that has stirred a little bit of discussion and, and some concern about the presence of major allergens in the classroom and all the issues of banning and whatnot. And we'll flash forward. Our recommendation is now that it's great that schools stock epinephrine. Not every state, not every state has a mandate to do it. A lot of the states are voluntary. So if your state isn't stocking epinephrine or uh, I mean, if your school district is voluntary, this is the time to get on your school district to be like this. If we're ever going to do it, this is the year now. Like we don't want anything to happen at all. Where it's stored has always been a little bit problematic to me. It's stored centrally. Uh, most the model that's used now is that the school has its own designated stock and then every allergic kid is supposed to supply their own. And all of these, and I've gone into my, 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 my children's elementary school at the time, it, it's like in a central area in these little baggies in a nurse's station, um, if they have a nurse, and not all districts have nurses or whatnot. This is the time to maybe decentralize it and think about 
wouldn't we want this in the classroom as close to that child as possible? If we're really that worried about the fact that they could react because there's now food in the classroom, why have it way down the hall or across the school? So our recommendation was to strongly consider for the food allergic kids storing the device in the classroom because that's where the reaction is gonna happen. You want to be prompt when you use it and eliminate even a minute or two for some kids, you know, that, that you don't want to waste any time. Um, and, you know, even before when people were eating in cafeterias, there's still some distance It maybe a little harder to have it in the cafeteria, but if we're going to eat in the classroom now, it makes a lot of sense to put the epinephrine devices in the classroom and to have an action plan for the kid. Mm -hmm. And you could make an argument, does Johnny's milk action plan differ than Jamie's peanut action plan? Probably not. I can't think of any ways that it would. So should you just give the teacher a universal action plan? Like if you see these symptoms, these are how you treat, these are the steps to do it. But there should be something there for the teacher and to start really training now the individual teachers, maybe more so than we've done in the past, because again, you're eating in the classroom, the epinephrine is there, the teachers are going to be the ones that have to respond first or whatever sort of adult is supervising uh, the, the eating if the teachers take a break at that point. But you've now just moved it from a common area into these individualized pods in the classroom. So that's really what you want to do for policy is match sort of where it's going to be stored and, 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 and used. And um, honestly, I, I think that, that that's something that it's not just in the pandemic. Why not do that Anyway, I mean, mm -hmm. you have these fail safe of the undesignated units that will remain central, but those units really have the most value when they're as close to that child as possible, um, which gets into other work that Marcus Shaker and I have done that was published in JAMA Pediatrics two years ago about modeling. Is there a better way to be doing the stock epinephrine? I think this is one step that we can do this in a pandemic, but it's one of those things that's like, hey, how does this not make sense doing it outside of the pandemic? So two, two follow-ups, one, um, hopefully relatively easy. One is uh, any uh, storage requirements for epinephrine? Is it room temperature okay? It's like a human. It doesn't like to be too hot, too cold. It doesn't do well <laughs> with a lot of ambient sunlight. Um, some may have a proclivity towards cold, dark rooms. I don't know. Um, no, I mean, stored in a desk. I mean, it should be, it should be out of direct sunlight. It should be away from a very strong heat source or from a deep freeze. Um, room temperature is just fine. I'm assuming the heat stays on in these classrooms overnight, um, but uh, you know. Okay. And then the second one, you know, every medication form I fill out says there's a line um, for whatever medicine it is. Um, any concern or adverse reactions should this medication be given to another student accidentally? Uh, and I know there's a lot of concern about epinephrine with the needle and, you know, potential side effects and things like that. So if we're going to say keep it in the school or keep it in the classroom, maybe not under lock and key necessarily, but in the unlikely event that somebody should receive it when they're not having anaphylaxis or somebody who doesn't have food allergy, uh, what would happen? Um, it's funny. When I testified for when I when I was working in Michigan, I, I got asked this question by one of the Michigan legislatures. What happens when you give it to a non-allergic kid? What's the risk? And it's sort of in my mind, I'm chuckling. I'm like, we have a big enough problem with it not being given to a kid who's having a reaction mm -hmm. to worry about, you know, the non. So um it's gonna sting. It's a needle. There's no gentle way to put a needle through skin. So yeah, that that's gonna it's gonna hurt. Um, you want to keep it away from the digits. I guess there's sort of a risk of a, 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 a vascular occlusion or whatnot if it goes into the fingertip. Although most of those are 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 fine. Um, you know, like yeah, that that kid's gonna have a little bit of energy and jitteriness. Um, I I think the risk is is probably. Um, minimal that, that any of that will happen, but um, these are also risks that happen if it's given wrongly to a student in need. Um, a very, 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 I think it's 0.05% of the very small percent that have the congenital heart defect of the anomalous right coronary that's buried mm -hmm. where you could have some risk. I mean, again, it, it's, these are out there. I mean, just like any of us could get plumped by a piece of falling space debris on any given day. I mean, there is a discrete <laughs> probability to that. I'm not saying it's strong, but like, yeah, there, you can make a bet in Vegas on that and um, yeah. you'd be glad to take your money. On that. But I mean, it, it's, it's one of these, it's one of those issues where that's theory. And that to me sounds like an excuse that somebody would be using to kind of 
maybe maneuver around what's more of a common sense policy. Well, we got to worry about all these other kids. Why don't you worry about the kids that it's going to help the most and stop making mm. up these exotic theories of how this could backfire. Like fix the problem first. Stop worrying about fixing the blame. So. Okay. Um, you know, with with some of the anticipated changes to the classroom structure and half days, you know, full days, who knows what's going to happen based upon each individual school district. Uh, in your opinion, which school personnel should be trained regarding food allergy management? Every single person that's at that school. Mm. It's just like, you know, everybody needs to know what to do in a fire drill or these days active shooter drills or whatever odd things that our kids are doing. Uh, we had hurricane drills as kids. So I guess, you know, it's, it's all where you live and, 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 and whatnot, but, um, you know, or tornado drills, but, um, it, it's, uh, yeah, I, I think anybody who's got primary responsibility for supervising a kid at any point during the day should know how to treat a reaction. I think if everybody who works in the school from sort of janitorial or custodial staff to, you know, bus drivers, anybody, I think, you know, the, the chain is only as strong as the weakest link in it. And mm -hmm. if, if people, if everybody knows how to do this, just like it's like with universal CPR, if everybody knows how to do this, then you'll be able to respond to events and not have to worry that the wrong person is, is the one who's sort of attending to that patient who doesn't know what to do. So um, I don't think the training is all that hard. We train parents every single day to do this. I think you know, the bar is really low for training. There's a bunch of stuff online yesterday during a telehealth encounter. Um, I, I, I trained a, a, a parent. I, we just sort of shared a screen, shared a, a, a YouTube video and how to, how to do this and what to look for. And it gave sort of examples of what these signs and symptoms look like. So um, I think it can be done. Um, again, I think people make excuses. Well, we don't have the time. We don't have the budget. Like this, this is something that can be done in five minutes if you are really motivated to do it. It needs to be reinforced every year or frequently during the year. But I don't think that there are that many barriers to doing it if, if this was really a priority. So um, that's what I would rather parents focus on, not worrying about banning peanut in their classroom, but making sure that everybody there knows how to use the device that could potentially um, treat their child. And, and, you know, if that's the one person who happens to have to respond to your child, you want every single person to know how to do that. So again, I think we tend to focus our energies on sort of non-productive arguments within um, this paradigm. And we ignore the simple ones that would really resonate at a policy level and, and, and improve outcomes. So, um, yeah, I, you know, this is like we said before, it's a, it's a time of change. Um, so, you know, it, this is a good time to reinforce some of the basics and, you know, uh, there may be some potential benefits if, if schools are able to adopt some of these things. Um, you know, as we as we wrap up here, uh, just a couple more points to consider. Uh, it, you know, it, it's it's just impossible for us to cover every single nuance and situation and circumstance that, you know, pertains to risk for, you know, food allergen exposure based upon age and classroom size and stuff like that. But are there any sort of common themes that you would have parents focus on like you mentioned art supplies before uh can you expand upon that a little bit yeah i mean I, I i think this is the time to really focus on just making sure everybody has to like all right what are your priorities this year for school what are people most worried about what are you dealing with so you've got pandemic issues and then you've got the normal issues of, of your child um, attending school and whether we like it or not school really goes for one size fits all. Um, so everybody has to find a way to get along and accommodate one another here. So making policies that really are to the detriment of one segment and very minimal benefit of a very small segment probably is not the most productive way to move forward. So, um, you know, just remember if you ban allergens in a classroom where it was never banned before, you are affecting a lot of kids that, you know, that wasn't how they operated. And, you know, if let's say that you, well, we want to ban most of the major allergens. Well, now your peanut kid who can, you know, your peanut allergic kid, who's only allergic to peanut. If you ban milk and egg, now you're taking away food choices for them too. So just be careful what you ask for in that context. And there has been discussion like lobbying the CDC to ban all major allergens in the classroom, if that was going to be the policy to eat in the classroom, which makes zero sense for a lot of reasons. Um, but I mean, considerations for art projects and whatnot, I think common sense dictates that, you know, bringing in something for lunch is one thing, but when every kid in the classroom has to touch that art supply, maybe peanut butter or that allergen is not the best choice. There are other things that you could 
use paste. I mean, who knows? Maybe don't do a bird feeder. I, I, I mm-hmm. they're, they're just like, make it easy on yourself to, um, you know, choose things that are going to sort of limit the potential for any argument or potential health issue to begin with. And again, I, I think that that's this year is going to be tense already before you brought in any of these other issues with accommodating kids, where they're going to eat, how they're going to eat. Do you ban this? Do you ban that? But in the, in the Rasa, we are very clear. If you had something in place last year where we are absolutely saying you don't have to change that it's new stuff. Like you don't have to outthink the issue here. If you're worried about new policies or whatnot, go back to the evidence, hand washing, uh, be, be, be a little bit cautious in sort of crafting material and stuff like that. Um, surface washing, move the EpiPen or whatever device you are using into a, a location where it's a little bit easier, train everybody around. We really tried to make common sense recommendations that could get through a very, very tense year but also had value past the pandemic. I think mm-hmm. the food, the, the, the physician community, the allergist community is, has really sort of lost, I think, a lot of its voice. We are reactive and we are not necessarily the ones making the policy. We're agreeing with other people um, when they're saying, oh, right, we should do this, we should do that. It really should be a partnership. But this is one of the few documents, I think, where we have our voice as a physician saying we're the experts. Like, you know, this is a moment where we we have to sort of say, here's what the evidence does. And we are making, and this is a favorite quote of mine, and, and, and you'll know where this came from if, you, if, you, if you're into this, but we make recommendations. You make the decision on how to use that. That's Dennis Morton. He's a Peloton instructor. And I guess I just outed myself there. But, but it makes sense. You know, these are recommendations. We're not telling you what to do. We're saying if you are inclined to, think that this is a good idea. Here is a way forward, but ultimately it is up to you how to handle that. And again, that's what any guideline is. It is, it is just a list of plausible ideas and often backed by some evidence that they could work. So, you know, I think everybody needs to just adjust to what could be a very long, frustrating and potentially tense year at times. It, mm-hmm. You know, if, if, if 2020 has taught us anything is that tomorrow will bring a new type of craziness that was not anticipated mm-hmm. today. And uh, I guess those are hold my beer moments, but uh, you know, I'm sort of one upping uh, the next day's events. So yeah, well, you know, um, as as we kind of wrap up here, there's one last topic I'd like for you to discuss. And you know, there was a, a section in this rostrum that uh, specifically addressed bullying um, yes. surrounding food allergies. Um, why was that included, and why is that important, and and why do we need to think about that as we as we potentially go back to school? But so. Um, if you think about the cafeteria and a lot of schools use things like peanut free tables or whatnot, it was a little bit isolated. And, you know, the, 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 the kids, th- there was an area there. Now you're moving into a classroom where there's not, I mean, there's spacing, hopefully uh, there's some spacing mm-hmm. in the classroom, but uh, it, it's not like it was where there's, you know, physically other tables and you can sort of aggregate with your, um, your friends. Uh, we, we know that bullying is is an issue in school not just the food allergy but lots of other things the, the kids are just mean sometimes and and that's part of being a kid you learn not to do that and how to sort of talk with people and and, and do it in a way that that's not making somebody feel bad just for your own sort of um uh, I- 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 inherent self-pleasure um but you know bullying now could come into a whole other context because it's right in front of you. You're in the classroom. There's just more exposure to it. So if there's a bully in that classroom and maybe they, you know, had other things to do at lunch than come up and directly harass you at your peanut free table. Well, now that might be the person who's sitting next to you in your classroom. So I I think with all the heightened issues and with kids, maybe seeing a little bit more how some of these other kids might eat lunch and it, it does increase the potential for events to happen. Um, you know, it's also putting now the teachers in sort of direct um, line of refereeing these situations, whereas there might have been a lunchroom monitor or somebody else who dealt with it. There might be a little bit less experience. My, my son used to come home and he was like, ah, kids have political conversations and they pick on you if they <laughs> found out who your parents did or didn't vote for it. I'm like, what the heck is going on? I mean, like, you know, I, I mean, so like, there's always a new angle for two kids to sort of get into an argument about like... Again, you're just increasing. It's already a tense year. 
you add sort of the eating of food with restrictions or something, you know, it, 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 there's just, it's important to understand yeah. that, you know, things have changed with change comes a new context for somebody to potentially bully. I'm not saying it is going to happen. I'm definitely not saying it sure. won't happen. So I, I think it was important to address. It's, it's, you know, it's hard to say how many kids really get bullied. The studies are looking at sort of one referral center reporting something in Do all referral centers see that same rate. I mean, I think there's a distribution around it, but yes, by and large, kids do get bullied for their food allergy. It's terrible. It's it's unacceptable. You know, the advocacy groups have been good about their zero tolerance campaigns and whatnot. Um, the schools are going to need to be on the lookout for this, not just for food allergy, but other forms of bullying. Again, nothing here is going to be sort of dated just to a pandemic situation. These are things that can really evolve the policy of how we manage food allergy at school going forward. And we were very careful in how we wrote this for that reason. Yeah, Ed, yeah, I, I agree with you how important that is, that topic. And I'll just like to add on very briefly, you know, the other thing is it's not just the other children, but, um, you know, adults and teachers. Uh, sometimes it's it's more subtle forms of bullying or, you know, uh, excluding kids with food allergy from certain activities or making snide remarks about, oh, I wish we could do such and such, but we can't because so-and-so has a food allergy. So um, yeah. I agree, and I'm glad that it's included and in, in a good topic for, for people to consider. Yeah, there there is counter-transference everywhere, and um it's like that Pink Floyd song where they're talking about the teacher taking out the cruelty on the kids, you know, and uh, I think it's another brick in the wall part one. Um, but, um, you know, I, I mean, it, it, it's, we know that the kid, sometimes the teachers take it out on the kids. They really shouldn't, but it, it, it could happen. And it's, it's a way of somebody who's dealing with their frustration poorly, but you're right. Sort of the subtle points coming out and kids don't get the sarcasm or maybe they do. I, I don't know. I mean, but they're, there's no place for it. I mean, again, everybody has to deal with the situation at hand and make the best. You go to school to learn, you go to school to make friends and, and social situations and whatnot. You know, hopefully people are, 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 are civil to one another, but. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I think that's a, it's a great place to kind of wrap things up. And I, you know, Dr. Greenhot, I can't thank you enough for taking time to be with us today. This has been a very detailed conversation surrounding uh, an important topic uh, and that I know it's, you know, near and dear to the heart of a lot of our listeners. Um, yeah, and before we say goodbye, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I mean, look, thank you for having me on to talk about this. Um, you know, again, this is, this, this is one of those issues where everybody's got an opinion and, you know, some people are very sensitive to the evidence points and, and um, um, you know, be interesting to hear the feedback on this. Again, the approach evidence-based, that never fails, you know, keep it simple. Try to remember that everybody has to navigate a very difficult situation together. And, you know, things that worked last year when we weren't dealing with some of these external things maybe need to be rethought. And it's always a good time to sort of look within oneself, how you're doing things in, in sort of a cycle of total quality improvement to understand how we can do better. And I think that this is an opportunity that we can take. It's, it's a shame it had to be a very bad pandemic to sort of force some of these issues up to the forefront, but um, take the current where it serves. So. Excellent. We hope you enjoyed listening to today's episode. Please visit www.aaai.org for show notes and any pertinent links from today's conversation. If you like the show, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast through iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play so you can receive new episodes in the future. Thank you again for listening.